I'm going to talk about using the web as a source, uh, as an implicit training set, which is um, using it not just um, as a source of uh, n-gram frequencies, but also for, I mean, really as a corpus. And you see what, what I mean by that during the talk. Um, essentially, so what, I, what I'm going to do is, first I'll, I'll have like a brief introduction, and then I'll walk you through three problems. And I'll spend most of my time on the very first one, because you are looking for details. But I'll, I'll have like a lot of time for the other two problems too. So first is non-compound bracketing, which is a syntactic problem. Paraphrasing non-compounds, which is essentially a semantic problem. And then machine translation, which is an application. I mean, this is how, you, how those two things can be applied to a real task. So what we do in natural language processing, the ultimate goal is to have something, programs, write programs that can understand language. Of course, this is hard, so what we do instead is we focus on particular sub-problems. And the dominant approach recently has been a statistical corpus-based one where you get a very large collection and then you compute some statistics over it. There has been this influential paper a couple of years ago, 2001, uh, by Brinko and Banco and Brill, scaling to very, very large corpora, where they have this very simple problem. Uh, spelling correction in particular context. So if you have, I'm in the third year as a principal of Anamosa High School, should you spell it that way or that way principal, okay? And essentially, if you, if you used to have uh, a training data, then you can probably like have a classifier that looks in the surrounding context and you know tells you whether, uh, which, which of the two options is more likely. Um, the problem is that, I mean, where does this uh, training data come from? And the, they were lucky that, I mean, for this particular problem, you can get as much training data as you want by just assuming that in well-edited text, I mean, the correct word will be used. So what they have found is that, uh, you probably know all that. I probably should not spend that much time, but okay. I have it, so sh should I skip over this or should I continue? Okay, so... I mean, the, the main idea is that it's better, it's better to get more training data as opposed to fine-tuning your algorithm. And essentially, okay, essentially what they found is that, you know, the, the worst algorithm here is kind of the best over here and the best becomes worse. And actually, here is, there is no much difference between the different algorithms. So essentially, the, more, the, more, the main idea is the more data you get, the better your algorithm works. It's for this particular task, maybe not for all tasks, which is a great idea how you can extend it to other tasks. So there is another, another you know, famous paper using the web as a baseline by Lopata and Keller, and they have these eight particular different tasks. And uh, for some of them, I mean, using very simple engram frequencies, they find that, I mean, using the web just because of the scale, you can get results that are much better than the best uh, uh, supervised uh, algorithm published so far. For others, you, they don't find like significant differences, and for others, they could, could not improve. So their conclusion is that the web engram should be used as a baseline. So this is the very first thing you should try. Essentially, I have built on this work. Now compound bracketing, I have moved it from, from this group into this group and prepositional phrase attachment from this group into this group using uh, techniques that I'll talk you, uh, about in a little while. So, I mean, the main thing is that probably the potential of this idea is not fully realized. There are more things on the web, uh, you know, in addition to the engrams. So there are other sorts of information. And what I'm advocating is really using the web as a corpus as opposed to just as a, a source of engram frequencies. So the very first task is non-compound bracketing. And uh, here's a particular example. So you have like this configuration of three word non-compounds. And here you have liver cell wine and liver cell antibody. And from a syntactic, from um, you know, part of speech point of view, there are all sequences of three nouns, and even like the first three, two words are the same, but the syntactic structure is different. Here we have like an antibody that targets the liver cell, which means that uh, liver cell is grouped together and then you add antibody, and here we have cell wine, you know, that is derived from the liver. So you have like, you know, you have like essentially a right bracketed versus a left bracketing structure. And if you want to, to find out the semantics of the noun compound, you probably need to solve this problem first, okay? So you need to make a bracketing decision between a left and a right structure. So, and previously it has been 
addressed using uh, probabilities. Uh, you you look for the whether the association between the first two words is stronger or the association, the association between the second word is stronger, or you can think of in terms of dependencies, and then like you look for an association between the first two words as opposed to association between the first and the third one. And then Wapata and Kewar, as I already said, they use the web instead of a fixed corpus. And then there, there is also some supervised work that makes, you know, uh, unrealistic assumptions of asking for the particular word net senses. What I'm going to talk about is uh, how you can use, in addition to webgrams, also paraphrases and surface features that can help you solve this particular task. So this is the old stuff. The old stuff is okay. So you have uh, these three words, and the, the adjacency model will ask, okay, is the association between these two words stronger than the association between those two? And the dependency model will ask, okay, is the association between those two words stronger than the association between the first and the third? And I mean, the idea behind the uh, dependency model is that, I mean, what is the head and what is the modifier as opposed to who is adjacent to whom? And you can do this using like uh, angle, uh, bi bigram frequencies or probabilities. And this is all old stuff. And, and essentially, like um, for this conditional probability, how you can estimate it, it's very easy. You just can just go and query you know, the web for the frequency of the bigram and the frequency of the uni uh, unigram. And you can take the ratio. Of course, you can also like do inflection variability, say like for poor and single and so on. Okay. But there, there is more on the web, you know, that, that, that can be used to, to help you solve this particular task. And uh, f for example, there are like these surface markers that authors in some particular context can use to tell you whether it should go left or right. Because, I mean, whether they make it consciously or not, um, I mean, they leave some particular surface markers and you can also use different kinds of paraphrases. And the good thing is that the enormous size of the web makes these surface features frequent enough to be useful. And here is a particular example. So the very first uh, feature that I have, if you have cell cycle analysis and if you find it somewhere else with a little dash between the first two words, it probably tells you that, you know, it's cell cycle, you know, it's a left bracketing, you know, there's some strong association between those two words. And if you find, you know, between the second to one donor T cell, it's probably right bracketing, although the right the right dash is kind of ambiguous because it can, its scope can be the whole thing. Fiber optic system, it's really targeting the whole. So they are not as reliable on the right. But on the left, they are. And you can have like dashes between everything in some particular context which are unusable. Another thing is um, possessive marker. If you have brain stem cell, brain stem cell is really ambiguous between, because there is a part uh, of the brain called the brain stem, and there's like also the stem cell, so it's not clear whether it's like a left or right bracketing. But if you find it elsewhere, brain's stem cell, it probably tells you that stem cell go together. And if you find it brain stem's cell, it probably tells you that the left, you know, the left words are together. Of course, I mean, this is not deterministic. I mean, you, you can just use this in a particular probabilistic model, but this is some evidence that can tell you. And then these features can, uh, can occur together, say like brain, stem cells, so, so you have both a dash and a you know, possessive marker. Another thing is capitalization. If you have plasmodium, vivax, viv viv malaria, I mean the fact that malaria is uppercase and vivax is lowercase and you don't care about the first one, it probably tells you it's a left, it's a left bracketed because, you know, these two. Again, I mean, um, so I'm trying to find elsewhere uh, the, noun, the noun compound that is uh, spelled in, in this different way. I mean, I don't want the original one to be spelled in this way. And also like uh, for the other one. Um, there are some pro Except sorry. For all these new uh, companies and products that have random capitalization in the middle of their words. Right? Yes, it, it, it can work. He, here we have like uh, different kinds of organisms, so in biology, I mean, no, not all models will be used. I mean, will, will, I mean you, you will not have these particular features, these particular patterns, they will not happen for every single noun compound, but for some of them it will. And for some of them, some will be better, some other will be better for something else. And you have some problems, vitamin D deficiency. This D is really a convention. I mean, you cannot really use it. I mean, there are some problems with this one too. Uh, and thrombin digits also can be a problem. Um, here's another one. Say, say you have the noun compound leukemia lymphoma cell, okay? If you find it somewhere, leukemia slash lymphoma cell, 
this means that it's an alternative that tells you right bracketing, you know, for the for the original one. Because you cannot it cannot be the case that leukemia modifies lymphoma if they are uh, alternatives. Another thing is just like if you have growth factor beta, I mean like different kinds of brackets can tell you, you know, that it goes like left or right. And essentially even even like even things like one cancer, colon patients, I mean, I have found that even uh, such punctuation, I mean, that goes in, in, inside the engram are, you know, good weak predictors of which way it should go. Another thing is you can have like, you can look at the uh, surrounding context, say like mouse brain stem cell, this probably means that those two go together and if those two go together, maybe those two I mean, should go together too, so you have like a right bracketing. Um, the problem is that the search engines ignore punctuation. So, I mean, for different reasons. So you cannot really have a query that uh, you have brain stem cell, you cannot like query for, for this little dash here. So what I do, uh, because I mean, I just have access to the search engine as a regular user. Um, I issue a query, say like for brain stem cell, and then I, I take the top 1,000 documents and I try to find it. I mean, the punctuation is ignored, but I, I want to see in the little snippets whether the punctuation that I'm interested in will happen. And if so, you know, I extract it. Why don't you use a Google Engrams? Sorry? Why don't you use a Google Engrams? I think that the Google Engrams doesn't have this punctuation information, right? Or I thought it does. Mm. Does it? I'm, I'm not entirely sure now, but, but I, I was always in the, okay. under the impression that it does. Okay, but anyway, this is something that I did back in 2005, so it was not available oh, okay. anyway. So, okay, another, another thing that, but for some of the features, you can, you can query directly the search engine. So here's, here's another very, very highly, uh, highly accurate feature, say like tumor necrosis factor. If you have tumor necrosis, TN, this abbreviation happening here, okay, this means that these two go together. Okay, because this abbreviation happened in this context, and this predicts a left bracketing. If you have like tumor necrosis factor, and then in parentheses NF, right, it tells you a right bracketing because it only abbreviates the second two. And you can what you can do, you can go in Google and you can say tumor necrosis TN factor or tumor necrosis factor NF. I mean, okay, you don't have the uppercase, you don't have the, the parentheses, but it still kind of does the work. Of course, you have problems with state names. I mean, if if those two words happen to be a state name or like a short word or, you know, uh, Roman digits, but most of the time, you know, it works. So another, another very important and highly accurate feature is concatenation. So if you have healthcare reform, okay, healthcare, it's very likely to be spelled together. I mean, just, you know, for, just because it's, it's, it's almost lexicalized, I mean, in English, okay, it's, it's spelled both ways. And uh, care reform, not that much. Health reform, not that much. And you, you can like test the adjacency model. Okay, do I see these two words to concatenate it as opposed to do I see these two words? Or the dependency model. Do I see those two words concatenated as opposed to do I see those two? Or you can like have it in the context, like healthcare reform. So you want to concatenate the first two in the context of, this, of the third one. Or you concatenate the second two in the context of the first one. Okay? So, Another thing is, okay, you can just like see, you use the Google star operator and see, okay, if, does it happen that, you know, they are, they are kind of to get close to one another, but like those two are together and the other one is separate. And I mean, if the first two are together, this, this is like left bracketing. If, if the second two are together, this is right bracketing. Um, another thing that you can do, you can just like try to uh, um, move, say like the first two, here you have a like care reform health, health care reform, you just like move those two in front or like reform health care. And this will probably happen more often than this one. So it will be an evidence for a left bracketing. Another thing is inf internal infection variability. So if you have bone mineral density and if you see inflections here, bones mineral density, this means that probably those two are going together. So you have like a right bracketing structure. And if, if you hear most of the time inflection variability over here, you know, it tells you that uh, you have a left bracketing. And in each of these models, what I'm trying to do, I mean, I'm looking at these models in isolation. So, for example, if I, if I want to see the internal inflection variability feature, I see how many times 
I see this pattern, okay? Say like I have it five times. How many times I see this pattern? Say like 10 times, then this model wins. Then, you know, the whole model votes right, left in this particular case. And another thing is, sometimes when you have a right bracketing thing, say like a dot male rat, sometimes you can like switch the modifiers. You can also see male dot rat. This tells you right bracketing because you cannot do it in the case of left bracketing. So, uh, you, can, you said that it votes. That means it's it's considered a binary feature ultimately. Yes, each each of these features is binary. Not depending on the actual relative frequency of the two. Oh, or is it, is, okay. Is, is there any reason why you turn it? Into um. Okay. So there is a reason, and the reason is I mean I'll I'll show a little bit later, but I mean the reason is that I want it to be unsupervised. Of course, I mean, it's not entirely unsupervised because I give the polarity of the feature. I say, okay, this particular feature votes left or votes right. This is some sort of supervision, right? I mean, and in addition to that, I give the particular features. I mean, so there's some, some sort of supervision, but it's, it's, I mean, it's not supervision in the sense that, okay, here are 100 examples. In this particular example, you have a left bracketing. In this particular example, you have a right bracketing. Uh, the, the amount of supervision that I have, it's like very light, and it's just like the polarity of the particular feature. And I didn't want to use training data. I wanted to be unsupervised. So that's why I have this using the bypass an implicit training set. And also, I had only 244 examples. And with that many features, I mean, I need a lot more in order to, to, to have weights for the particular methods. But I mean, if you ask me how I can do it, I mean, to, you know, to really have like a classifier, I mean, a supervised model, I can I can talk about that, you know, at the end of the talk. Or if you want now, but it will like interfere with I have planned for. Maybe I missed it, but did you look at uh, font? Sorry? Font information. So like bold this is very bold and italic or uh, or a hypertext uh, anchor. Actually okay. So I haven't, but I mean the thing is when part of the reason is that when you have like a brainstem cell like in in the quotes um it will make it bold in the snippet right. so i mean what what was it before i mean it's kind of lost i mean th th that's part of the reason you have to go to the original yes source. but but this is expensive and i yeah. didn't want to do that so okay okay so another another important uh, kind of source of information is paraphrases okay so if you ask a human what is a brain stem cell, they can say, well, those are stem cells that are in the brain or that are from the brain. So this is a way to paraphrase it. How you paraphrase it? You paraphrase a noun compound using verbs or using prepositions, okay? Most of the time, there are other kinds of, of paraphrases. Or you can have like a copular paraphrase, say like skyscraper office building is office building that is a skyscraper, okay? So what I'm doing is I am, um, say, suppose I want to bracket brain stem cell. I would um, generate, I would put, for example, stem cell together. I would generate different kinds of prepositions. And maybe here determiners. Maybe I'll do some inflections, singular, plural, here and here. And I'll see how often, you know, maybe this happens two times, maybe this happens 100, 100 times. So I have some, uh, some frequencies for that predict left bracketing. And then I have also some that predict right bracketing. Oh, sorry, this is left, this is right. So here I have cells from the brain stem. Um, and here, because brain, brain and stem are together, for brain stem cell, this is like a left bracketing, okay? And what I'm doing, I just sum up the left predicting paraphrases versus the right predicting paraphrases, and I see which number is bigger. And this is the paraphrasing model. Yes? I was wondering uh, how much difference it makes to just see whether the, the two words are together and there's the other word somewhere in a window. It doesn't whether it doesn't really matter. This is this, this, this is this feature. Right. I already so, have it. But is it any different than the Yes, it is, because because this one this this one doesn't work very well. I mean, and we will see like in the, in the results. And the other one works much better. So Okay, so and prepositions they have been proposed to um, you know, as uh, a source to get the semantics of the noun compound in terms of prepositions uh, before, but I'm not, I don't want to predict the, the semantics, I, I'm trying to predict the syntax. And all I'm doing, as I already said, I just count. So cells in the bone marrow, this, pre this you know, predicts left, I have that much. This predicts left, I have that much. And I have some evidence for right bracketing, I just sum up, separating the left and the right, and I compare the two. 
Okay, so about the evaluation, what I have is um, there is a standard data set of 244 examples uh, put together by Wauer. Uh, they are extracted from the Grolius Encyclopedia. And in these particular experiments, I limited the, I used the Google exact phrase queries and I limited the language to English. So here's how the Wauer's data set looks like. So we have like triples of words. Sorry. So this bracketing uh, decision, couldn't it be that in certain contexts it would be actually opposite? So it, it, it would definitely make sense to make it in a particular context, but the data set that is considered the standard one and that you know people compete against doesn't have context. It's very similar to the way that the data set for uh, prepositional phrase attachment, it's, it's in the same format. You just have the four, uh, na the, the four words outside of any context. And if you want to be comparable to somebody's previous work, I mean, you have to use one of those data sets. I mean, it's an artificial task, I agree, because you don't have the context. And when you have the context, it probably changes a lot of things. But yeah, this is how, how it has been handled before. So you just have the three words and a left or right decision. Okay. So and here's how the, the standard uh, models, the engram models work. This is like adjacency, uh, the adjacency model. I mean, remember the, the model that checks uh, whether the association between the first two words is stronger than the association between the second two. So frequencies, probabilities, pointwise mutual information, chi squared. So you make prediction for 100% or almost, and you have precision 75, 73, something like that. And with the dependency model, which checks the first two as opposed to the first and the third, um, you have something 79 up to 80%. And I, I have here the confidence intervals. Uh, and then using these stars, they don't work. I mean, okay, the precision is better for the adjacency, the depend for the de dependency you lose, and then you lose a lot on coverage, okay? So here are the, the interesting ones. The concatenations, the concatenation triples, remember like concatenating the, the first two words in the context of the sec second one, they can be extremely, extremely precise, 96.20%. It's, it's really good. Um, but it, it only covers 32% of the examples because you cannot expect to see this all the time. And but, but other kinds of concatenation, say like the dependency, it's it's again 80%. Here's what happens with the paraphrases. It's 82 and 80, 86% coverage. The surface features, so you, I mean the surface features, remember the ones with the little dash and like the little commas and the bracketings. Um, you have 85% precision, 87% coverage. So the abbreviations and the possessive markers, which for which you can uh, you can have a que direct query to Google, because although the possessive marker is removed, you still have the S, say like bonds. You don't have the apostrophe, but still, you still have S. So you can still use it. You still have pretty high precision. So what I'm doing, I'm, I have a majority vote. Uh, here and again because I don't I want it really to be unsupervised in this particular case So I have a majority vote of the ones that are in both. I mean those two these ones and You know the chi-squared So what you get is 90% precision and 95% coverage and then if you default everybody else to left Which is most of the time you have left. This is your baseline. It's left bracketing you get 89% so how this uh, uh, relates to other work, the baseline is 66%. Uh, Wauer, who used a fixed collection, the Grohler's Encyclopedia, he had 68% precision uh, with the adjacency model, 77 with the dependency. Uh, my chi-squared using the web is 79, almost 80. Then Wauer has a tuned uh, model, which is 80.7, and this is mine. And this difference, you know, this is statistically significantly better than this one, and it's all statistically significantly better than these models. This one is supervised, and it uses also additional training data, which is mixed with this one, so it's not directly comparable. This one is um, partly directly comparable because they used half of the training data for tuning, Kevra and Wapata, and test only on half of that. Okay, so 
about now compound bracketing. So what I have done is I have introduced these surface features and these paraphrases as an additional source of information. And I have uh, obtained state-of-the-art results on this particular task. So now I'm going to move um, and there, I mean, this particular task, although it's, it's kind of artificial, it has applications to, to, to I mean, it's a lot of these, of these features that I have developed, I mean, they have applications for other tasks. But even this particular task, I mean, um, uh, people have, been, have used this, there was an ACL paper this year about um, adding dependency uh, structure to the flat noun phrases in, uh, word, in, in the pantry bank. In the pantry bank, you know, the, the noun phrases are flat and it's not clear what word depends on which one. So they used a lot of these features that they have developed to add a dependency structure. And then there's another thing that uh, has uh, something to do with uh, what a search engine probably has to solve is this query segmentation problem. And there's like a direct relation to uh, uh, noun compound bracketing, so okay, of course it's a little bit different because in a query segmentation for used car parts, which is like three words, you have four different structures and because you also have the option of keeping everything together or of separating everything. And in bracketing you only have two options. Uh, and there was an EMNLP paper and if you want, I mean, I can, I can go into more detail about that. I mean, how the particular, you know, the kinds of features that I have developed apply to this and this supervised model and they have also interesting findings. But essentially they have like a binary decision between every single pair of words. Okay, should I split here? Should I split here? Okay, so the next task that I'm going to talk about is a um, semantic one, paraphrasing noun compounds. So consider a noun compound like malaria mosquito. And they have been like different kinds of semantic relations uh, proposed for this particular, um, you know, if you, if you want to characterize semantically the noun compound, malaria mosquito, maybe it's a cause relation or it's a source relation. I mean, those are like uh, abstract relations. Uh, other people like Lauer have proposed using prepositions, say like it's mosquito with malaria or it's oil from olive, okay? And uh, they, they are some approaches that are somewhere in between that have both verbs and prepositions. And what I want is um, I'm looking for the verbs that can be used to paraphrase it. So that malaria mosquito is a mosquito that carries, spreads, causes malaria, transmits, and so on. And these verbs can be useful for, uh, um, I mean, they, they, can, they can be used, for example, like in a search engine. I mean, if you have like malaria mosquito, uh, if, you, if you have on the, on the web page, um, if you have on the web page um, verbs like carry, spread, causes, transmit, and so on, you probably are more certain that it's, it's about this particular kind of malaria mosquito. Um, and this, I mean, they, they can be used also instead of, sorry, you can use it in ranking. Or another thing is, if you have malaria mosquito, a mosquito that carries malaria, they are the same thing, okay? And when the user asks for the noun compound, you can use for the other one or vice versa. You need to decide when a uh, noun compound is equivalent to a particular paraphrase. So how I extract these verbs is a very simple technique. Essentially we have, okay, we have a noun compound, the first noun, the second noun, and here we have a pre-modifier. Pre and what I do, I turn it into a post-modifier, so which is a relative clause. Instead of noun one, noun two, say like malaria, mosquito, it becomes like mosquito, dead, something, malaria. And then you look for the intervening verbs, which is a pretty simple. And I use the Google star operator to do that. And you'll find things like, say like here is for migraine treatment. It's treatments that are out there for migraines that should be given and so on. And if you ex just extract the words, you end up with things like, you know, migraine treatment is treatment that prevents migraine, is given for migraine and so on. And if you look at uh, different things like cancer treatment, migraine treatment, wrinkle treatment, they are interesting things, for example, um, Cancer treatment, okay, it treats cancer, prevents and cures, that's good. But wrinkle treatment, it's reducing wrinkles and smoothing tre treatments, but does not prevent them. So there's something about the semantics. And here's how it compares to uh, previously specified, you know, high level um, semantic relations, say like 
Malaria mosquito has been proposed that it's really cause. But if you think about it, it's an indirect causation. It's not that the mosquito doesn't, doesn't really cause malaria. It's like the, the particular virus that the mosquito transmits is causing the malaria. So, uh, okay, here in, in, in both, I have verbs that, you know, according to me, support this particular relation. And the ones in, in italic are ones that don't directly support this particular relation but I still consider them relevant. I mean, I still think that they correctly paraphrase the now compound. <laughs> and you see that there is not, I mean, not that much overlap sometimes. Say like, mosquito that carries malaria, spreads malaria, transmits malaria, brings and so on, it's not direct causation. Okay, and then here I have, I have an agreement with humans. I mean, the kinds of words that I extract, I mean, I have set up a task with Mechanical Turk, Amazon's Mechanical Turk, asking people to, to give me uh, verbs that can be used to paraphrase a noun compound. And this is what they gave me, like for malaria mosquito. Carries, causes, transmits, infects, and so on. And this is what I have. So, and you can see this like kind of agreement. I have done this for, for a big collection of 250 examples, but I'm still like collecting the data from the Amazon Mechanical Turk, so I cannot give you the final results right now. Okay, so you can, you can apply this for um, finding relation between, between complex nominals. This, is, this was the same about task. And this is what the task is. So you are given a particular sentence, which is your context, and you have two entities that are marked entity one and entity two. So here you have like vessel and tools. You're also given their word net senses, which are not using. Then the particular relation, content container, you have to, to, to make a binary decision about whether vessel and tools in this particular sentence are in a content container relation or not. And then you are also given the particular query that has been used by the annotators, uh, by the people that put together the task. I was a co-task organizer. Um, th that was used to extract this particular sentence. So here are examples of the seven relations that were used in this uh, particular competition. So we have cause effect, instrument agency, part hole, and so on. So content containers, say like apple basket, plain cargo, origin entity like desert storm, grain alcohol, and so on. So what I'm doing here, um, I, I, just, I just go on the web and I look for sentences that contain both words. So, here I have like one star or actually essentially up to eight stars. And I just try to find, I mean, sentences that contain this word and the other word in any order. And then I extract the intervening verbs and the intervening prepositions and the intervening coordinating conjunctions because they somehow have to do something with the semantics of the relation that connects those words. And he said, here's what you get, say, for a committee member. For a committee member, you have, um, it's a member of a committee, committee includes members, member serves on a committee, uh, member chairs the committee, committee has member, consists of members, and so on. Here you have the frequency. Here you have like what kind of uh, entity it is. Is it like a preposition or a verb or a coordination conjunction and the direction because whether it was the first noun before or the second noun after. And this, you know, you can use this as a distribution of, uh, you know, the distribution of these uh, verbs and prepositions and coordinations, you can use them to uh, make classification. Essentially, in this particular task, you had uh, training data 140 uh, examples and the testing that data of 70 examples. And what I have, I have a nearest neighbor classifier. You know, I have, uh, for each of the training examples, I have a, v a vector like that. Okay, and then when I have a test example, I produce a vector like that too, and then I, I compare it to each of the, of the individual vectors, and I choose the, the label or the one, you know, that is closest to my vector. And I'm not using like a class-based model because they don't work very well. And this is something that Peter Turney and other people working in this task have found. Because I guess that the relation is not, it's, it's kind of fuzzy. I mean, it's not very well defined. I mean, what is really like content container, what is really like part hole, and so on. So the, the instance-based models work better for this particular task. And the features that I have, the, verb, the, the web features, verb prepositions, verb prep 
plus preposition, uh, coordinate conjunctions, and then also the context features like the sentence words, entity words, and so on. Yes, I have like a k nearest neighbor uh, classifier in the dice coefficient. And here are the results, UCB, this is my system. Um, under the condition that I don't use the word, the, the I mean the, the query, I mean by query I mean this query, I was allowed to use its word too. And um, I don't use WordNet. I didn't want to use WordNet because I think this is an unrealistic assumption to have the particular correct WordNet sense for this particular noun in this particular context. Okay, and um, I have the second best system using up to eight stars in between the words. I mean, remember when I was fishing for them. And if I use 10 instead of, of eight, I mean, I get even better results which are better than the best system. This is not statistically significant, but still. And then in the, in the condition where you, I'm, I'm using also the query words, I have the best system and you, you get even better when you have like 10 stars, which is again a support for the, this theory that you know having more data you know, gives you better results. Yes. What kind of model did the uh, UCDX theme system use? I, I, I cannot tell from the top of my head, but I mean, they, there's, a paper, there's a paper describing, I can, I can open and I can show you, if, if you want right now, I mean I have it, but yeah, I cannot from the, later. okay. So, okay, and now I'm moving to the, to the final task machine about machine translation. So machine translation is, uh, I mean, I guess, is anybody here familiar with machine translation? I mean, okay, yes, okay. So then, then I mean, then I shouldn't, shouldn't like spend much, much time on it. But anyway, it's, it's trained on parallel text and um, phrase-based machine translation, you, you extract pieces of text which you call phrases that are not necessarily linguistically phrases. I mean, they're just some particular piece of text and you have some probabilities associ associated with them and this is the backbone of, of the translation process. I mean, when you have like a particular sentence that you have to translate, you, you are trying to find, you know, good pieces of text whose translations you, you know. The problem is, okay, so suppose you have this phrase, Spain's economy, okay, and now in, in your training, in, in, in your text that you have to translate, suppose you have the economy of Spain. I mean, it's not exactly the same thing. It's syntactically, it's, it's a kind of equivalent, but it's a little bit different, so you will not match it. And, and uh, in this particular case, this is probably not, not much of a problem, but in other cases, when you have a non-compositional translation, you can miss an opportunity to correctly translate, you know, some, something non-compositional. Non so my idea is, okay, maybe you can go and you, you can paraphrase the, the phrase table, okay? So you can have like Spain's economy, economy of Spain, the economy of Spain, Spain's economy, Spain, economy of Spain, of Spain, of the Spain. Some of these are crap, I mean, some of these are wrong, some of these are correct. And you can probably use the web to filter the bad ones, okay? So here are some examples of uh, what happens when, when you paraphrase the phrase table that way. So for example, you have like percent of members of the Irish parliament, it's percent of Irish parliament members, percent of Irish parliament's members. I mean, they're kind of the same thing, I mean, from, from a syntactic point of view, okay? And I'm, I'm paraphrasing the source, the source site, uh, you know, the source language, and I'm translating from English into a foreign language. And in this particular experiment, I have from English into Spanish. And here is another one, say like, the danger of infection with AIDS, okay? Danger of AIDS infection, uh, AIDS infection danger, AIDS infections danger, I mean. So what I'm trying to do, essentially, okay, another thing that you can do is, um, probably paraphrasing the phrase table is not the right idea because the pieces of text are kind of, I mean, they are cut, you don't really have the context when you have like a, some long noun phrase. I mean, you probably have just the beginning of it and it's, it's, it's just wrong to, to, I mean, you, can, you cannot paraphrase it correctly. So maybe it's better to paraphrase the whole sentence, okay? So the next idea is, okay, you have your training corpus, you have this particular training sentence and you paraphrase it in different ways and you pair each of the paraphrases with the original Spanish translation 
translate, you know, the, so you have, you have this, you have, you have, for example, we must cooperate in relation, this should be, should include UN initiatives. This is like an English sentence, it has some Spanish translation. You have several paraphrases of this sentence, okay? And you pair, you say that this sentence has, that each of these sentences has the same Spanish translation as the original one. Because the kinds of paraphrases, I'll show you shortly what kinds of paraphrases I'm doing, they are very likely to be meaning preserving. So here's essentially what I'm doing. What I'm doing is when you have something like an instrument of economic policy, which is like a noun phrase with an internal preposition, I'll turn this into a noun compound. So it will be become an economic policy instrument. And here, when I have a noun compound, I'll do the reverse. I'll like split it, I'll, I'll paraphrase it with a preposition. So like AU budget becomes budget of the AU, okay? So those are the kinds of paraphrases that I do. And so what I'm doing, I'm parsing the, the English sentence, and then I'm, I'm looking for patterns where you have like a preposition, prepositional phrase in science, an MP, or when you have, where you have an compound, and I'll turn this into this and this into this, okay? So, and these are, these are the kinds of paraphrases I have. So here, you, okay, the lifting of the beef import bun, the beef import bun lifting. So I'm removing the preposition, making it into an compound. Here I have like um, putting a possessive marker, the lifting of the beef import bun, the beef import bun's lifting. Um, or something that has a possessive, you know, genitive marker, I can just remove it. Commissioner statement, commissioner statement, or commissioner statement, statement of the commissioner. And all these are kind of syntactic. And then when you have to break a noun compound, you have to use the web. I also, I'm using also the web for these ones because not all of them are always good. Say like inquiry committee chairman, inquiry committee chairman, you can like put a genitive marker at some positions, or like the beef import ban, ban on beef import. I mean, we generate a particular preposition. So how do I do a para, para, the paraphrase? Say, suppose I need to break an noun compound, like beef import ban lifting, okay? So I try all possible groups, like beef import ban lifting, beef import ban lifting, and so on. I mean, like keeping, like putting a break at each position, and then I try, he's like the word to the left in the particular sentence. RT is, is the word to the right. N1 is, you know, this piece. N2 is this piece. And then I try putting the possessive marker here, preposition and optional determiner, that uh, copula determiner or that copula preposition determiner. And, you know, I, I just choose the most frequent ones and I generate uh, a couple of different paraphrases. And I can have multiple options, say like UN initiatives, it's like initiatives of the UN, at the UN, in the UN. They are probably all good. Or maybe not, I mean, it's, I mean, it, it makes mistakes sometimes. So the results, what I have is, this is, this is the baseline uh, for 10,000 sentences. You have a blue of 22.38. Um, if you paraphrase without using the web, you lose. But, what, sorry. What okay, this is the Euro, Euro Parliament Corpus, 10,000, and this is the um, 2006, where you have like the lower case data, which is already tokenized. Uh, yes. So 10,000 is a very small set of the training corpus, I think. This, this, this is only on 10,000 sentences, and, but I have, I have here something on more, okay? So what happens, how much time do I have? But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm around the end. Yes, I have like two or three slides more, so, okay. Sorry. So, okay. If you, I mean, here I, I have only like the, the first four rules. So, which means that I'll turn something into a noun compound, but I'll not split noun compounds, okay? And then if you do that, you lose. But if you, if you also split noun compounds, then you, you get some improvement. If you paraphrase the phrase table, this is this result, you still have some about the same improvement, okay? But what, what is really good is when you, so, okay, this result is um, like, so S is like the original system. So you, you train the original system, you, you end up with some uh, phrase table, and then 
this one is the phrase table over the paraphrase corpus, okay, which is kind of bigger, where, where you paraphrase the, the sentences, and then you merge the two, the, the, the two phrase tables. And uh, so, and you, you can merge, merge them in different ways. One way is uh, simply to merge them and to prefer if you have like a phrase that is coming from the original uh, corpus. Um, I mean, you prefer this one because the, the probabilities are better than the ones on the paraphrase corpus. And another thing that you can do is you can have additional features that tell you whether it came from the original table or whether it came from the, from the new table, the paraphrased corpus, or whether it came from both. And you can also, like, in addition to paraphrasing the corpus, you can also paraphrase the phrase table. And they have experiments, but you don't have much, much of a difference. So, okay, and then here, this is like the, the, the size of the, the phrase table. Um, 180,000, and here you have 300, so 280, which means that, yes, you do generate more phrases. I mean, you do have more phrases in the phrase table. And yes, you do use them, because here you have 40,000 used, and here you have 56,000. I mean, this is, this is how many phrases you have after the, the phrase filtering in Moses or in, uh, I mean, when, when you do the recording. So, I mean, when you, when you test, I mean, you do use on testing more phrases, yes? You said that you have a preference for the original example to paraphrase. Yes. So, yeah, how do you specify that with a weight? Where yes. do you get the weight from? So, okay, here's what's happening. I have, I have in the phrase table something with some particular weights, right? So the problem is that when I paraphrase and when I train, the probabilities are kind of wrong. Because for this particular phrase, now I have 10 paraphrases. And for this one, I have only once. And now, like, the lexical weights are different. And also, like, the, the, the weights, you know, the, the probabilities for the particular phrases are different. And I don't know what is correct. I mean, I, can, I have no way to, to, to calculate it because this particular phrase never happened for some of them. Some of them happened. So what I do is I, I would put here an extra feature. You know, the decoder can, can, can have... Uh, additional features. So uh, I, have, I have an extra feature that tells me, okay, this came from the original phrase table, or this came from the, from the, from the second, you know, from the paraphrase corpus. Or, I mean, it came from both, because this, this can also happen. And it will, like, somehow learn preferences, you know, to prefer one to the other. Uh, however, even, even if I just merge them, okay, and, and if, if in the case when you have the same phrase coming from, both from the original and from the paraphrase corpus, I would keep the, w the probabilities from the original one because I trust them more. If I do that, I mean, I have 23.5. If I use this extra feature, I have 23.13. The difference is very small. This tells you that, you know, the kinds of paraphrases that I'm doing, they are pretty, you know, very meaning preserving, okay? So here's what happens when you, when, when you work with bigger corpus. I mean, you don't earn that much. Here we have from 22, 38 to 23, 05. On 20,000 from 24, 33 to 25, 0, 01. On 40, you know, I mean, the gain is, is, gets smaller, okay? But if you, if you look also here, I mean, this gain also, the gain of doubling the, the training data also gets smaller. So, I mean, and essentially what's happening is what I'm, Getting from here to here, I mean, from the baseline to what I do with the paraphrases, gives you the effect of between 50 and 33% of the gain that you would have, uh, you know, gained by doubling the amount of training data. Doesn't it get bigger when you double Sorry? The Doesn't it get bigger when you double the training data? Or do I mean 22.38, 24.33, that's less than 2%, and afterwards it's more than 2%? Also Which one? From 10K to 20K, the improvement is less than 2%, right? Yes. And from 20K to 40K, it's more than 2%, right? Yes. I, 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 don't, I don't know, yeah. Didn't hmm. you just... Yeah. Yeah, they're both about I mean, I, I, I don't know why this happens. I mean, because... I mean, so I just I have, like, minimum error and training. Sorry? The, the improvement slows down so far. The, I don't know. Oh, I see, okay. From, from 40 to 80... Uh, oh, you, you're saying here it's not? Hmm, let's see. Okay, so, so it seems to 
He here it's almost two, here it's almost two, but but here, you know, it's kind of it's only half. So but but, but anyway, I mean you would expect that with, with doubling the training data, at some point, I mean, you you don't you don't, I mean from you you don't earn that much by doubling the, the training data at some point. I mean and uh, sorry? So, so that, would, that would be your expectation. You would uh, not, not gain much from doubling the training data. Yes. And essentially, I mean, I have, I have a fraction of that. OK, it, this is just a generalization because, I mean. I guess the one question is, by the time doubling the training data stopped improving performance, whether the paraphrasing will do anything or not, because you may have covered a, a lot of these. Yes, kind of yes. So, so what, 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 what I think is happening is that, I mean, when you have a lot of training data, this paraphrasing will probably not help that much. So it, it's probably helping for, for the cases when you don't have that much training data. Maybe like you have like 50,000 examples or like the sentences or like 30,000 or something like for, for less covered languages. I mean, then you should expect improvement. Um, you, you can try to do that. Okay, so and I'm, I'm paraphrasing the source side. I'm not paraphrasing like the target side because the target side, mm, it's, I mean, you, you, you can probably get some improvement by paraphrasing the target side, but only because you can produce probably something more fluent. I mean, you can only like improve fluency. But really the power of this thing is to, to, to find, you know, to match more phrases in the input. This is where, what, what, what you essentially want. And another thing that you can do is, you can probably paraphrase the target sentence that you want to, translate. So, and you can, you can think of maybe like normalizing the, the training data. For example, like if you, if you want to translate something from uh, English into Spanish, then, I mean, because Spanish doesn't like noun compounds, okay, it likes prepositions, you can probably like paraphrase it so that in the in a training time you can have like, you, you can get rid of all noun compounds and you can have like, uh, you know, prepositions instead. And if you learn a model like that, that really translates from English without noun compounds into Spanish, maybe you can get better improvement. Or, I mean, you can, when you have a sentence to translate, you can just like generate several different options, I mean, several different paraphrases, translate each of them, and, but then, but then you need a reranker. I mean, you need something to choose which one of them, so you need some training data. I haven't done this yet. So, and yeah, I participated in the um, shared task of WMT and from English to Spanish on News Corpora, I have the best system on a couple of measures. Unfortunately, I'm not using this particular paraphrasing technique because I didn't have time to, for the minimum error rate training and so on to complete. So yeah, I have like a best score on Blue, Meteor, uh, and a couple of others, and if you're curious what I used for this particular submission. So, okay, this is the baseline system as described on the WMT, uh, you know, website. And then just by changing the tokenization, you have like half a point of blue. And the way I'm changing the tokenization is essentially, okay, for example, um, when you have something with a, little, with a dash, I mean like say like brainstem, together, I mean, I would put spaces around the dash. So I just like put more, more spaces around the, the, the separators and this seems to help. And then I'm using like uh, sentences, not a flint up to 40, but a flint to up to 1000. I use, of course, lexicalized reordering, two language models, one trained on the Europe Parliament and the other one on just this side. And I have like very high order. I'm not sure I should have used that high order. And I also use cognates. This is the kind of blue that I have. But unfortunately, I couldn't use this paraphrasing for this one because uh, the experiments did not complete in time. So, okay, to wrap it up, um, what I have done is I have uh, described to you, um, I mean, I have proposed to use additional sources, I mean, using the web, not just a source of engrams, but, I mean, using different surface markers and using different paraphrases to get better results. And I have achieved results that, uh, for the noun compound bracketing, I have res achieved results that are better than the best published algorithms. So, of course, there are probably more exciting features on the web. And, I mean, there are other problems where you can apply such kinds of features, and it's already happening. There are people that use some of the features that I have proposed for query segmentation. There was this ACL paper this year. 
And yeah, I mean, what I'm really advocating is using the web as a corpus, not just a source of engrams. I mean, really like getting into the text and, you know, maybe like extracting the words from there, extracting prepositions, and so on. So, that was it. Thank you. Thank you.